Welcome to the Megat Weight Podcast and YouTube channel. Hello, Shibuzo. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to be my guest today. I've been looking for this moment for such a long time, as you know. Thank you, Megat, for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so Shibuzo, I don't even know where to start with you, but maybe the easiest place to start is by asking you, who is Shibuzo? Because you're one of the people who's doing magic behind the scene, if but yet almost, you know, no one would know, but could you tell us more about your background and what led you to where you are here today? And by the way, you're joining us all the way from Lagos, Nigeria, right? Yes, Abuja, Nigeria. Abuja, sorry. I thought, you, I, thought you, I thought you were in Lagos this whole time. Well, you know, I, I work between Lagos and Abuja. Uh, we have offices in Lagos, Abuja, and Southeast Nigeria. So uh, in a given week, I could be in three places at the same time. But today I'm in Abuja. Got it, got it. That makes sense. Okay, that would explain why I thought so. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Chibuzo and um, uh, born in Eastern Nigeria quite some years ago. Um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, primarily, that's my vocation. And I've been one for upwards of 33 years. Mm -hmm. Initially as a litigator, but in the last uh, 16 to 20 years, I've been more of a consultant attorney, you know, working on uh, quite a lot of things. But my specialization and a lot of my work has been around public procurement, public-private partnerships, uh, advisory for uh, development projects and programs, and lately advisory for special economic zones. All right, so we're gonna go back to what you, what you just talked about there, uh, the special economic zones. So yes. Uzo, I have a question for you, like what, what um, because you know, right now, I'm, I've been having a many conversations with friends of mine and um, tech seems to be doing, tech seems to be one of the uh, areas that seems to be, you know, doing much better, especially in Nigeria, you know, within the past nine months, you know, six, I believe it's six, uh, three, within the last, last nine months, at least uh, three unicorns. And we're hearing about fintech companies being invested uh, in every, almost every other week, every week, we're hearing multiples, multiple series uh, being raised. Um, so, but I also know that for someone like me, I look at it and I'm just like, hmm, are we right now thinking that tech is, was this, you know, the, what's gonna be this, um, this, this that's where we're gonna find our salvation um, for the lack of development on the continent. And um, I do have some friends who are flat out just plain um, not happy with um, almost like the bravado that we can feel from the what they call the tech bros sometimes. <laughs> I should probably not say that because you know, they'll be very mad, but, um, <clears throat> yes, I am, um, and I feel like I share that concern with that. That maybe because the tech sector is working better, and I'm so excited about it, by the way, don't take me wrong, but, um, but some of us are worried that maybe um, we might think that tech is the answer to all of our problems. Where do you stand on something like that? Do you, do you feel that tech is the answer to everything? I mean, wh what do you feel? Yeah, I, I think straight away I can say that um, I share a bit of your concern. Uh, it's wonderful that the tech sector is growing. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, we're beginning to see some phenomenal uh, developments, but phenomenal but sporadic developments. I, I need to emphasize the fact that it's sporadic. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, a whole lot of new tech initiatives have received huge attention and in fact, investment. But you, when you sit back and think back, you also wonder whether, uh, you know, tech alone uh, can get us to, you know, the, the, the promised land. Uh, I'm not too sure that tech alone can get us there. Um, statistics, international statistics shows that development has largely been driven by manufacturing. In fact, improvements in GDP have often from the 17th, 18th, 19th century up until today, been driven largely by uh, manufacturing. Uh, if you look at, I, mean, I think it was in 2008, uh, the World Bank uh, Growth Commission 
uh, did take a look at uh, countries that had, had achieved uh, you know, GDP growth above 7% for over 25 years. Out of about 12 countries they identified, uh, nine or 10 of them, their growth had been driven by manufacturing. And there were three exceptions. Those three exceptions, uh, I think, were um, Oman, uh, uh, Botswana, who had single uh, product exports. In the case of Botswana, uh, diamonds. Amen. And then the third exception was Hong Kong, which was you know, an offshore uh, financial center. But, but if you looked at the data completely, you will see that sustainable growth in GDP, sustainable economic you know, growth and development that you know, cuts across board, that supports more people getting out of poverty has often through history come from manufacturing. Manufacturing is one of the best drivers for technology. A lot of technology breakthroughs over the years, over centuries, have come from manufacturing itself. That's one. Two is that manufacturing has a tendency to have more improved linkages to other industries. Manufacturing leads to increased demand for skills. It leads to increased demand for inputs. It leads to you know, increased productivity and increased productivity improves, improves GDP and improves demand and when demand improves, it again improves productivity. So it has a ripple effect on the economy and manufacturing itself can be the base for development of technology. And so whilst technology is good and uh, improvements in technology and you know, technology infrastructure is improving in Africa, I happen to think that Africa still needs manufacturing. I am 100% agreement with you and I think also the other, the other aspect that I worry about very much, even when it comes to technology and the technology that seems to be attracting investment on the continent, I feel like right now, maybe it's just me, but I feel like it's all FinTech. And I'm just like, when I look at, um, at the volume of the customer base, you know, even continent wide, it's still not that many people. <laughs> you know, we're 1.3 billion uh, people on the continent. So the amount of tech, um, FinTech companies that I'm seeing, I just, I'm not understanding where, how does the, how do the economics work here? And also we also oftentimes hear about this funding, that funding, and oh, with this revenue, this amount of uh, transaction going through, but we're talking about tiny, 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 you know, percentage in, um, in, in profit, even when there's profit. So, so that also worries me that even when we're talking about tech, it seems to be mono, a mono sector, which is a FinTech sector. And I'm wondering what you think about that. I, I, I think that, you know, there's, there's a race going on. That's where I see there's a race going on. The FinTech industry globally, I had seen quite some phenomenal growth in the last 10 years. And as more and more people, uh, as they get increased adoption in the developed world and the middle income countries, and as they seem to achieve coverage, full coverage in those areas, uh, the only other unconquered territory happens to be Africa. So the investors, the companies themselves, uh, the entrepreneurs, the managers, are all pouring into Africa at the same time. And that's why you're seeing the trend you're seeing. So some will succeed, of course, some may not succeed, uh, but that's, that for me explains the, the level of investment uh, and, and it would all run into competition. And that competition can be good. It can improve, bring about improved products. It can improve adoption. It can improve permeation of technology. There are a lot of good things that can come from it. Uh, but I'm also hoping that entrepreneurs will look beyond FinTech and focus a little more on productive processes, improving production with local technology, uh, and then looking at uh, expanding production to our customary and traditional areas, uh, which should of course include agriculture and our way of life, our culture, and a, a lot of that. that. That will give us an area in which we will be more dominant, we will be a lot more regional, 
and we would have something to sell to other parts of the world that they're not just selling to us already. Right. Even from the aspect of culture itself, uh, mm -hmm. if we can uh, you know, have new innovations in uh, theme, in um, music, in you know, uh, the cultural you know, elements of our, you know, our lives, and which will enable us you know, sell something unique to us, have something that don't, only us perhaps can sell for a number of years. I, I think that'll be more productive that will be more sustainable, and that will involve more people than just the fintech sector within technology. Got it, got it. Why are you feeling that it is the case, uh, Shibuzo, that um, why do you feel like we're not seeing more manufacturing in Africa and maybe more of these other you know, business activities that you, you just described? Why, why do you feel like that's not happening, has not been happening? Yeah, that's that's a big question. I, I think, um, I think I, I can I can tick off a number of things on my finger that you know pose the greatest challenges. You know, of course, first you, you can look at not in any any particular sequence. You've got to look at infrastructure. Infrastructure is a big problem. Uh, whether it's power, whether it's roads, whether it's uh, water, electricity. You know, generally infrastructure, uh, very big you know, challenge. Second to infrastructure might be the poor, what I would call poor, inadequate, or uh, not so smart, you know, government policies. Because manufacturing is, is driven by being, you, you have to be deliberate about growing manufacturing for manufacturing uh, to grow. Again, very important is human capital skills knowledge you've got to grow knowledge i mean let's let's look at look look at africa today uh, about 40% of all you know africans are illiterate right above of all africans above 50 years of age are illiterate right about 50% of women above 25 years of age are illiterate and so you see the number of people that illiteracy leaves you know, outside the room. And even when you look at you know, the people who are literate, sometimes you begin to measure the quality of education also that they've had and how empowering that education they've had has been. And you would then see the challenges that come from you know, uh, human, human, human development uh, as a well. So smart policies, you know, to, to drive manufacturing, a country needs to be very deliberate. You need to know your comparative advantages. You need to have policy that not only promotes your people going into business and actually producing a lower cost than others, because that's what enables you to sell, you know, but also that sustains the industry that enables the industry to sustain and grow. And except government is deliberate about such policies, uh, you know, uh, economic development is slow. If, if you look across the developed world, look across Asia, for example, you rarely find any of the countries we, we, we think are developed or developing without, you know, very huge support for exports from their countries. And that, that counts for much. You find uh, an India today launch $5 billion, uh, you know, export promotion program. You find, uh, you know, uh, many other countries announce huge amounts of uh, export promotion support for industries in their country. And you find that even though there's global competition, the countries find ways to protect their local industries, you know, to some extent from competition, and notwithstanding the rules of WTO and all of that, countries still find a way to uh, protect their local economies uh, from, uh, you know, um, uh, competition. So all, all of that counts, you know, come together to, you know, either help 
or militate against, you know, uh, manufacturing uh, in, in the developed world. Got it, got it. So, um, so I guess you're touching, you're touching upon a little bit of what I was going to ask you next. It's um, about this whole question of what can we do to increase more manufacturing in Africa? So if you had a magic wand, uh, what, what, and I feel like you have built your own magic wand, <laughs> or you know, yeah, how to, yes. <laughs> you know how to do it. We'll talk about yeah. it. Okay, yeah. let, 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 let me put it this way. You know, first is invert the challenges. Whether it's infrastructure, whether it's education, whether it is smart policies, whether it is support for manufacturing, whether it is creating a safety net within your, your country or your environment. Because remember, one of the things that make the useful population leave is the absence of a safety net. Uh, like, I mean, uh, we, we make a joke around here in Nigeria that, uh, you know, Nigeria has become. Enyimba Football Club. Enyimba Football Club is a football club in Southeast Nigeria, Aba Nigeria. Enyimba has a reputation of always finding good talent and then within a year or two selling them to other clubs. So Nigeria has become, you know, the Enyimba Football Club, the global Enyimba Football Club. We have, um, we have poor health services, yet we have the largest number of non-American doctors working in America or in the UK, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Dubai, or in any other of the destinations. So, so invert those. Invert the you know, non-smart, non-supportive uh, you know, policies, and put in, in their place smart, supportive policies, which are focused on creating innovation, which are focused on creating productivity, which are focused on supporting uh, businesses to grow. And, you, you get all of that. But the, question, the thing is, is, it may not all happen. I mean, it's not so easy to do all of that at once. So mm -hmm. how, how do you begin? I mean, let, let's take an example of my country, Nigeria. You know, We should be a producing nation, or you should not at all be our mainstay for any reason. Th think of it this way. We've got almost any mineral you can mention. The mineral map of Nigeria has almost any mineral you can mention. We've got, perhaps in Africa, one of the largest stock of arable lands, you know? And we've got a very youthful population who have reasonable education. In fact, Nigeria happens to be the only country now, globally, where you can pay a STEM graduate $200 a month. So we've got cheap labor. We've got labor cheaper than China today because China is going a middle-income country. Yeah. And so the question is, how do you start? Yes, we have the challenges are infrastructure, poor government policy, you know, uh, poor social programs, no safety net, and you know, all of that. So how do you start? The best way to start, in my view, might be to create safe spaces. To create? Safe spaces. Okay, safe. safe spaces where you can very much easier, you know, than providing these things for the whole country, immediately provide good infrastructure, where you can, you know, in a measured way, provide smart policies, you know, efficient administrations that will solve the problems of inefficiencies and perhaps corruption, where you can focus on training the kinds of skills you need for specific industries that you can very quickly ramp up. And the special economic zones model presents us this opportunity. The charter cities model presents us this opportunity. You know, because look at it, and, and it has many other advantages. If, if you look at the, I think it was the, the uh, you know, World Bank Habitat Group that, uh, did a study of world population and arrived at the fact that today over 4 billion people live in cities and that by, I think, 2030 or 2045, over 6 billion people will live in cities. You know, in Africa, we're said to, by 2030 or thereabout, we should have about 400 uh, for something million extra people who should live in cities. 
Now, you, you, you look at our cities. Yes, there are nice places in our cities, but a large part of them are urban slums. Yeah. So to what extent can these cities contain this population that is estimated to happen in 20, 25, uh, 30 years? Of course, it means that we should expand these cities. How quick, how viable is it for us to expand these cities? And what level of misery do we bring as we bulldoze settlements and bulldoze livelihoods in the need to create uh, new cities? And look at it the other way around. Uh, statistics have shown that, you know, world economy is 70% of GDP of world economy is in cities, 70%, not 20, not 30, not 40, not 50. So development is driven by cities. And so if we have to live where we are, we've got to think about our cities. And there are only two options. One, expand the ones we have, which as you know, is difficult. The laws do not support this, you know, uh, massive, demolition of lives that result from uh, sometimes urban renewal. Uh, sometimes, often also, that it brings about social upheavals. There's resistance to it. Livelihoods are ruined by it. So the alternative is that we build green cities. We build startup cities. Exactly. And to me, really, that, that appears to be the better alternative so for reasons. First is, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry you, you, you were going to say something. Yes. Yeah, that, that seems to be a better alternative for many reasons. First is, you lose all of the disadvantages, the, the troubles you go through in urban renewal. Not that you won't undertake urban renewal, you will, but you can develop new cities and you know, provide infrastructure better and faster using modern technology, using today's knowledge to plan, build, regulate, and superintend the new cities in a way that they can drive innovation, wealth creation, and job growth. Additionally, new cities you know, enable you to try new things. They enable you to do things differently. They enable you to implement the lessons that have been learned from the way we have done things in the past. Thirdly, new cities, particularly charter cities, can enable you to have new administrative rules, smart governance, smart policies that support growth and support job creation, and policies that drive innovation. And this is easier done in a greenfield, you know, new project than in a fully populated city that has its own rhythm, its own life, its own flow. And yeah. so the new cities appears to me to be the best way to go for Africa. Fortunately, we do have the, the land, you know, required, you know, to do these new cities, if well planned. And we do have the high side of the challenges of development of the past, industrialization of the past, the things that were done wrong. And we do have the knowledge, current knowledge about sustainability, about resilient cities, how to build resilient cities. And all of this, can be built into the concept of new cities and they can be, be, become the most potent driver for African development. Unfortunately, uh, not many African countries have new cities coming up. A few are coming up uh, you know, across Africa, including, of course, Eyimba, economic city in Nigeria, but it's not yet uh, a common you know, uh, approach by you know, African governments to you know, uh, uh, drive development. But its advantages are numerous. I mean, look at our current cities in Africa. Uh, studies have shown that about 60% of African cities are democratic in the sense that their executives and uh, their legislative arms are elected. But, but you really know that the independence and autonomy required for city governments to take economic and smart decisions that drive growth is only nominal. Even in those situation countries where 
the government of cities seem to be elected, they are often still centrally controlled. Yeah. And so the, the, the right policies, the right, you know, the, 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 the autonomy required, the ability, the swiftness that's required to take economic decisions that drive growth are not there. And so our current cities are not able, even in large part, to provide services, services that are in themselves opportunities, economic opportunities. <clears throat> and so you, you will find that, therefore, that if you can find the mix of resources, ingenuity, skill, management, and of course, land and other things required, that we might be better off looking at you know, uh, new cities. But even more helpful is the concept of special economic zones and charter cities where, you know, uh, these new cities are given the autonomy to have, uh, you know, a more proficient administrative uh, mechanism and setup, and more proficient rules, laws, and regulations that may not apply in the general economy. And this is what happens with free trade zones and, and special economic zones. Because, for example, in Nigeria, uh, we have the, uh, you know, the NEPSA law, which allows uh, NEPSA to issue uh, a charter regulations, a charter, as it were, for running of a free trade zone. And so mm -hmm. if you can get a, a new integrated city under the umbrella of a free trade zone, you could actually have a, a very modern, um, you know, uh, almost private sector led, you know, administrative uh, regime and smart rules, smart policies that drive development running the city. And that's the case of Benyimba economics. That's exactly what we're trying to do in Benyimba. No, but this is fascinating. And as you know, I totally, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in these, uh, we call them startup cities, but uh, charter cities, startup cities, all of that, it's the same concept in a way. So, um, are you, so, I know that oftentimes when I talk about this to my friends, who, unlike you or me, have not been bathing more or less into this world of uh, startup cities, charter cities, <clears throat> if they just look at me and they're like, huh? You know, it's almost like <clears throat> for people, the law is something, the law is the law. It is like, what do you mean we're gonna, we're gonna bring a new uh, governance? And uh, later, <laughs> folks like you, entrepreneurs, uh, governance entrepreneurs, and people are like, what, what, what are you talking about? So we feel like we're trapped. So could you maybe walk people through even like how to understand this concept? Like um, even maybe what you guys have done. So you came to this place that um, in a way is subjected to the, to the rules of the land, and those rules are what we know to be happening in uh, Nigeria right now. And you're like, this is what uh, these um, institutions and these uh, policies are definitely not good for business and for wealth creation, entrepreneurial value creation. So we got to change this. And then you went on and you went on to kind of make these changes. And I, I've, I've heard you when you said it's easier to make it within a smaller plot of land where ideally there is not too many people living so that you can start from scratch. But from there, Shibuzo, try, uh, see if you can walk people through like what are the main steps um, that need to be taken? What needs to change and what are the main steps? Uh, you, you kind of touched upon it, but here I'm just trying to bring it back to, to just like a few takeaways that people can, can start putting in their heads as they start to even yeah. embrace ideas. Yeah. First, let, let me address the issue of the laws. You know, you see, every nation has sovereignty to decide the laws that guide its territory. And nations can decide to make laws that guide specific territories within their area of sovereignty. And so a nation can say, okay, I need to drive development. And since I can't immediately provide all it takes for development to immediately happen across all of my territory, I can designate a few centers and create rules in those centers that drive development, drive innovation, and drive growth. 
any nation can do it. And an example that's there for all to see, but unfortunately, people just don't see it is China. I know, I know. I mean, just think about it. A few, only three decades, I mean, four decades ago, China had less than 100 cities with more than 1 million people. Today, China has more than 300 cities with more than 1 million people. And most of them were special economic zones. Right. That's right. They created these places, they built infrastructure, they focused on specific industries, they put in smart rules that made sure that they supported that particular industry. They went around the world and brought everybody who is working in that industry. They grow that place, they leave that, they go to the next. That's all China has done. I'm so glad you're bringing it up because I see so many of our- China, yeah. No, yeah, I'm China in the, in the last decade has taken more than 400 million people out of poverty. That's almost close to half of the population of Africa. It's, an, it's insane. It's insane. Uh, exactly. I know in some reports they say it's 800 million people. But, um, you know, Shibuzo, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because oftentimes what nothing drives me more crazy from our brothers and sisters on the continent to be like, you know, and it's coming from this, this bizarre place of pride. I'm like, yes, it's good to have pride, but our pride is misguided because they're like, oh yeah, well, we, we don't have to do it like the West, you know, and we don't have to do it, um, you know, follow capitalism or anything like that. And I'm like, and then like, look at China. China did it her, its own way. No, China had to follow the free markets. The SEC- Exactly, most, exactly, right? exactly. The SEC is of the most free market zones in the world. And so what China did, let, let, let me explain this. This is what people fail to understand. China was a communist country. Yes. The rules that applied across China did not allow private ownership of property, right? But what did China do? China started to create these safe zones where it allowed the liberal democratic business rules to apply. And then as he created more and more and more, as he tested these rules, he began to apply the rules in these safe zones inside of his own country. Exactly. This is what China did. That's exactly so, right. So, so it's not about, yes, the Chinese will be the first to tell you they are proud of their indigenous culture, they are proud of their own way of life, but the Chinese applied the liberal business, you know, the liberal democratic business culture and principles to be able to drive the development they currently have. Thank you. And, and so it's, it's something we, we need to do because that's, that, that's the global economy. That's how it works, at least till now, that's how it works. But having said that, I, I want to go back, you know, and tell you a bit of how Enyimba has tried to, you know, solve this problem. Enyimba is, you know, is driven by the vision of one man, I mean, in a sense, you know, but what did Enyimba, what, what, what did Enyimba do? What's Enyimba trying to do? First is a public-private partnership driven uh, by, first by, you know, a private company in partnership with the state government. And then of course, subsequently, the federal government of Nigeria uh, has, has joined uh, the entity and is a partner in it. And what Enyimba has done is to try to look at the reasons why we haven't had manufacturing in Nigeria. Enyimba has studied most of the economic zones that have failed in Africa and studied all the economic zones that have you know, done well as well. And then studied the Nigerian economy and studied the Eastern regional and South South economy in Nigeria and came to a number of you know, conclusions. First, of course, the endowments that we have as a nation identifying those endowments. And then Enyimba is being built as a safe space to provide every single thing that has been identified from these studies that has militated against industrial de development, economic development, innovation in this environment. Enyimba is a free trade zone first, 
and being a free trade zone, especially economic zone, would have its own different administrative setup. It's a PPP project, a partnership between government and the private sector, but driven by the private sector. So it will be managed as a business. It will be run as a business. These rules have been made to encourage business. I'll give you a typical example. It takes, uh, in recent times, uh, the Corporate Affairs Commission, which is our company registry in Nigeria, will tell you there's uh, uh, 24 hours you know, registration of business. I mean, in the last two, three years, they'll say that. Uh, but in real fact, it's rare for you to get a business registered you know, in seven days, in 14 days. Anybody intends to register businesses in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, <clears throat> and that's just a bit of an example of how rules can make life easy for business. Anybody as a free trade zone is going to have a division of the custom service working within it. Police, immigration, all working together such that almost every permit approval that you require from those entities or government agencies would be under that rule, technologically driven with minimal human interface. Which is same way. That's great for Nick. Exactly. In the same way, it's administration. We have minimal human interface. Currently, anybody is working with a Silicon Valley, uh, you know, and some, you know, Nigerian tech companies to develop the entire technology architecture that will run the city. From, you know, identification of individual landowners, from land digitization, identifying who owns what portion, you know, down to uh, management of visitors, issuance of permit, entry, everything will be technologically driven. Enyimba has, is, the first phase of Enyimba is fully designed, shovel ready. You can tell, almost literally tell, where everything would be on a system like this one we're talking through. You know, you can, you, you have the hindsight of how things have gone wrong in cities before. And you're making provision for things that are needed today, the ones needed tomorrow, and the ones needed next tomorrow. You're looking at the possible population the city will carry. You're providing infrastructure from day one. If you start with a, a three-lane road, you have made a provision for an eight-lane road. And every you know, four, five years, there's expansion of that road as the population is, is increasing. You, Aimba, for example, one of the problems we found, you know, when, when people talk about challenges to uh, you know, manufacturing in Nigeria, the first thing they look at is infrastructure. And infrastructure is a challenge. But it does happen that infrastructure is not the greatest challenge. And I didn't really realize that infrastructure wasn't the greatest challenge to manufacturing in Nigeria till we started this project and began the study. The greatest challenge to manufacturing in Nigeria is logistics. <laughs> you know, the, the efficiency of bringing in your raw materials and getting into factory on time and the efficiency of getting out your products, you know, clearing from ports. I mean, the gridlock in some of our ports, it, it would take two weeks for the, the vehicles to get in to pick up a container and, you know, same time, sometimes for the vehicle to get out. And a, a, a factory is waiting. Staff are being paid. They're waiting for that raw material. That happens to be one of the biggest challenges. And if you look at design of Enyimba, Enyimba has an inland port that is leaked already by rail as of today with Port Harcourt port. And an 11, 12 kilometer rail line planned from LLA1 to on a seaport, we'll also connect it to on a seaport. And so we'll have an inland port supported by two seaports, connected by rail, by road. It is within 40 minutes, 
45 minutes to Port Harcourt Airport. It is within 35, 40 minutes to Owerri Airport. It is within 50 minutes to your airport. This it is, is 20 minutes from Enyimba City, Aba, and it is 25 minutes from Port Harcourt, the oil and gas city. It is sitting beside three kilometers from Owaza, which is the oil and gas, the gas capital of Southeast Nigeria. And it has active gas pipelines crisscrossing its territory. And it doesn't have one single homestead in the area in which it's being built. That's so amazing. no single dislocation of an individual. That is amazing. That's amazing. And so the city has been planned, is, is actually, um, is, is, a, is a regional economic plan. That's the best way to look at it. Because, uh, we, you know, we've, we've looked at, fortunately for Enyimba, the prime driver of Enyimba, the chief executive of Enyimba, is a town planner himself. Not only uh, a practicing town planner, but somebody, uh, uh, a, a former, you know, uh, lecturer in town planning, urban planning in Harvard. So he, he understands how to use cities to drive economies. That is, it's just so beautiful. The whole thing is so beautiful. And uh, yeah. yeah. We and so, for, for example, for infrastructure, we, we know we, we have challenges with roads, we, we, you know, and all of that. Enyimba has a, an external infrastructure plan, which includes taking the major external roads on concession. Unfortunately for us, whilst we were in project development, the government of Nigeria began the HDMI program, which is the Highway Development and Management Initiative which has put out uh, 11 roads nationally for you know, concessions for private companies. And then you has put together you know, a coalition, a consortium that has bidded for those roads. And as at the opening of the bids, the two main roads required by Enyimba, the Enyimba was the only bidder for those two roads. Because you know, bidding for roads is not simple. In the last two and a half years, we have been doing traffic studies, all sorts of geophysical studies around these roads. And uh, no, no wonder I can see why many other people who wanted to bid couldn't submit their bids. Because uh, if you were starting a year ago, uh, then you, you are early for the next bid, not for this one that just finished. Unbelievable. And, and so on those two roads, currently, Enyimba was the only you know, uh, bidder. And, and so, I'm reasonably certain, given the quality of the bids we put in, that we're going to get those roads on concession. And we have uh, consortiums that have the likes of Intertoe, uh, CECC, uh, and uh, you know, with support from uh, important financial institutions like AfriExim. So I, I, I think we would, we're, we're poised to deliver uh, those roads as well. Right. So, so you see, I'm explaining this so that you can match it with what I had told you earlier about the fact that a country is able to build a safe space and provide the, these elements, all of these elements, and the private sector can participate in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not easy, it's not simple, it's a lot of hard work, and uh, uh, you can imagine what the man who leads this has gone through in the last four years and think about some of us who are supporting him, who are gray hairs have, uh, you know, <laughs> shown to, we no longer have hairs in fact anymore because it's a, you know, 24 seven engagement, you know, uh, for years on end, you know, solving all of these, you know, putting the building blocks together uh, that, that gets this kind of project through. And I, I really think, yes, you know, we're hopeful this would, uh, you know, uh, begin construction uh, this year. Uh, but I, I don't want it, I don't want people to think it's just take and go. No, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy at all. It's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it, it needs a lot of thinking through. And you have to understand that, you have to understand project development. Uh, there are no shortcuts here. You, you have to study the economy. You have to prepare the project. You have to show the linkages and investors have to see it clearly. And so uh, it's not like uh, the regular, you know, government projects of announcing and then you put in equipment and they begin to work and then it ends and nothing happens now. You, you've got to literally have the project so ready 
that by the, once you reach financial close and start construction, nothing stops you from going forward. No, I mean, it's fascinating. And, um, and yeah, I think it's important because I feel like one of the mistakes we have made on the continent for most of um, governments, you know, around the continent, they're just going for this free trade. But what I call free trade, uh, I'm sorry, um, you know, free zone, free zone uh, 1.0. They're still stuck yeah. at free zone 1.0. And we're like, free zone shouldn't just be about tax exoneration or things like that. It's, we have to think about the whole set of laws that affect business, that affect doing business. And it's just not, like I said, you know, so you're there, you're gonna have the ta- not only the tax laws with exoneration stuff, but you're also gonna have the labor laws. You're gonna have this whole thing you're talking about, the c- a city infrastructure, you know, like, so, so this is fascinating. So uh, we're gonna have to have you um, on again, uh, Shibuzo, because we're gonna wanna go more into details of some of these things, because you're right, most people have no idea the amount of work that goes into it and the amount of planning that's a key word that goes into all of this, but done, but done from the private sector world. Because when you're in the private sector, your imperatives are very different than when you're just a go- when you're government. When you're government, there's a lot of stuff you can get away with, even if it doesn't work. Where if you're a private sector, you know your customer here is going to be the citizens. The citizens living in the city are going to be your. They're going to give you a cue. Are you doing something that works for them or not? And if you're not, it's going to be bad for you. So. Um, so we'll have you to talk more about those, but um, I guess my question at this point is, I can hear my fellow Africans hearing this and being like, they love, love, they love this, what we're talking about, but then I can see right away the question is like, well, how can you trust that the government is just not gonna come and take it away from you? Or how are you gonna have, how are you gonna make sure that, um, you know, what George Aide would call vampire governments would try to come and, you know, take it away or what's, What's, what's to guarantee this, this zone? Yeah, the thing is, the, the concept of public-private partnerships has developed well over the years. And if you know, I mean, um, there was once the concept of charter cities as uh, safe spaces guaranteed by some sovereign developed uh, government. Uh, and, you know, that had its challenges because that, literally would ch- challenge the, the sovereignty of each nation that yeah. allows that concept of charter cities to take space. And, and in that circumstance would, uh, over the years, raise antagonism a lot more from the population and the people. Uh, but when they are public-private partnerships trans- transparently entered into, uh, when the uh, informations are available and people can verify and confirm that the private sector is bringing value. And, you know, the, it's easier to manage and there's less, you know, uh, political backlash and less, you know, resistance from people. Also, when you adopt models that take account of the livelihood of the people around your uh, project area. Uh, for example, even though uh, Enyimba is not going to displace even one individual or one family in terms of homestead, uh, we're building a very robust uh, livelihood restoration plan to have uh, uh, all the problems. The, the first people to be digitized, even while we're still developing the pro- project, are the landowners. And in addition to compensation they will receive, the landowners are getting a percentage free carry on board of the company and are getting a board seat. They are going to be sitting in the boardroom from beginning. Okay. You know? So when you have that level of buying, you are actually insulating yourself from politics. Right. Because if you improve and enhance the lives of those people, then they're going to defend the project any day. That's right. So those kinds of mechanisms help and uh, the public-private partnership model enables you uh, to do that. Again, I say it's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's doable, you know, it's doable. And, and that's what we're trying to show that, that is doable. So then again, of course, the, the agreements have to be properly, you know, drawn up. Uh, the risks have to be clearly identified. Uh, uh, 
and allocated properly to the parties best suited to bear them. And when you've done that, uh, you know, uh, the agreements also provide for what happens when uh, attempts are made at expropriation and uh, other uh, maybe material adverse of, you know, actions uh, by government. And those help to regulate conduct too. Uh, so first is, uh, you know, if you're going into this kind of project, make sure your engagement is robust, engagement with uh, landowners, all stakeholders, engagement with government, and the agreements have to be well drawn up to take care of all the risks that uh, might arise on both sides. Uh, and also it has to provide for government to be able to evaluate and assess the values you promise to bring uh, to the table. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I give you, for example, our regulations, which is our charter, requires that we work with companies to provide companies located in Enyumba to provide jobs for the landowners. And so we have some responsibility to upskill the people and make them able and qualified for the jobs and on the other side, some responsibility to get the companies that are coming as we negotiate with them to commit to provide jobs for the landowners. So these things don't happen by chance. You, you have to plan for them. You have to write them into those documents, into those agreements, into those regulations, into those new laws that will guide the city. You know, I mean, our regulations stipulate that anybody is a smart city, straight out straight out, right? And even as the first thing we did was to you know, digitize the information of our landowners. And from there, we're building upwards. They're the first you know, city members. That's and from there upwards. So it's, 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 it's a lot of work, but it's, it's interesting. It's, it's simply interesting. I think it's beyond interesting. I think it's beyond interesting. And most importantly, also, it is such, it's a game. It's, um, I feel like this is where the, the, the change in Africa, this is where it's going to come from. So yeah. I, um, I almost know what you're going to answer, but I want to ask you because I like to always know from people. So are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about the future of Shibuzo? I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I'm an optimist. I, I love to think tomorrow will be better, you know. I, I believe that when your best stories of the past are greater than your visions of tomorrow, you're coming to your end. I'm always hopeful. I, I want to think that every new day is an opportunity to do something better than I did it yesterday. And it's, you know, I, I it resonates with, with me. And I think this is something I've found uh, very, very fundamentally important also to the project leader in Enyimba, who, uh, Mr. Dow, who, who leads the project. Uh, you know, and ever, you know, stringent effort to do better. You know, always hopeful that I can do better tomorrow despite the challenge that you see, that you face, uh, you know, you know, and perhaps for those, uh, you know, that are people of faith, maybe it's easier because it's really having faith in the future. You know, for, for me, if I lose faith in the future, life would be despondent. I would feel the same. Yeah, and though, so despite all the obstacles, all the difficulties, I think tomorrow can be better than today. That's wonderful. And I think that's the only way you can really make progress in the difficulties uh, around about us. Uh, and that's something, you know, that for me, uh, you know, I've learned, it's always been the way I've thought about life and that's something that drew me uh, to the project lead uh, of Enyimba and why, you know, I've stopped to the program. Enyimba is simply uh, reinforcing that fact that tomorrow should be better than today. 
I love it because, <clears throat> and I am very much with you, I totally agree. And uh, on that most positive note, uh, Shibuzo, I am gonna thank you for everything you've shared with us today. And um, I think you're gonna have to be a um, constant guest on, on here because there, I'm sure there's gonna be so many more questions and uh, maybe we'll get that up. Maybe we'll get a chance if you, if you uh, agree with it to come back and we can drill yeah. into aspects of it because this is, it's like I said, it's not only fascinating, but the promise, the promise of a new life that's in here, it's just mind blowing. And um, so that's why when I, when we first uh, connected with you, I was like, I don't know, I, as you know, I'm a, I'm a bit, um, yeah, I'm so fond of the work you do. I'm so fond of you and uh, what you guys are doing over there. So, so thank you, thank you for all I'll be back and hope you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be glad to come back. And yeah. hopefully once we, I mean, it's an intense time for us, uh, all of the team. Uh, and, and hopefully once uh, we, we begin uh, construction, it will be less of uh, an intense time. And we, we can mainstream the program into, uh, we, we're going to have a newsletter uh, coming out regularly soon uh, that would inform about the developments in AIMBA and uh, we, we have some media outreaches also that uh, ultimately, when they begin to come out, we can connect to your program, uh, some feeds that can, you know, continuously inform about the developments uh, in the space called the Imba. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shibuzo. We will see you very soon again, like I said, and as soon as you're going to, you have more time, um, we would love to have you back. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, my God. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yeah. This episode supports the upcoming release of my book, The Heart of a Cheetah, The Truth About African Poverty and the Future of Human Flourishing. Make sure to subscribe to my show on YouTube and Spotify and follow me on Twitter. Learn more at magadwade.com.